Tonight on The Readout. Find it just so out of sorts with the basic value system of the American people. And I think that across the board, the vast majority of the American people don't agree with a lot of the decisions this court is making. President Biden, in an exclusive interview with my colleague Nicole Wallace, responding to today's very predictable Supreme Court decision on affirmative action. And that is where we begin tonight, with the United States Supreme Court once again turning the arc of justice away from equality and back to the early 20th century, striking down the use of affirmative action in college admissions. The Roberts Court, which wouldn't even look like the court it is today without affirmative action, deciding in a pair of rulings that race-conscious admissions programs at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina violate equal protection under the Constitution. It is fitting, then, that it would be the court's first black woman justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson, who clearly articulated the cost of this latest regression, writing in her dissent, with let them eat cake obliviousness. Today, the majority pulls the ripcord and announces colorblindness for all by legal fiat. But deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. The best that can be said of the majority's perspective is that it proceeds ostrich-like from the hope that preventing consideration of race will end racism. The court essentially says in this ruling that after a generation or two of racial progress in education, after hundreds of years of ranked discrimination on the basis of race, we've done enough. We're all equal. Kumbaya. Everything's fine. Despite vast and persistent inequalities in wealth literally created on the backs of black Americans and kept in place for generations even after this country stopped enslaving black people on the basis of race in 1865. For the better part of the next century, America embraced the concept of separate but equal. Black students were told, yeah, you can have a school, but it's going to be a one-room shack with old useless textbooks that's only open when it wasn't planting season. And that didn't end officially until the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board decision in 1954. And then in the 1960s, white segregationist mobs rioted when black students had the temerity to try to attend schools like the University of Mississippi. And who could forget Governor George Wallace physically blocking the doors to the University of Alabama? Apparently, at least six members of the court have forgotten, the current court anyway, it's only really been since the 1960s that we have had any real promise of racial equality in education or any promise of fairness in society. And that was thanks to Chief Justice Earl Warren's Supreme Court in the 1950s and 60s, which revolutionized America, dramatically expanding civil rights and civil liberties for all Americans. The Warren Court ended racial segregation in public schools, expanded voting rights, upheld free speech, legalized interracial marriage, and paved the way for legalizing abortion. All landmark changes moving us forward. But this Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, or perhaps I should call it the Alito Court, will definitely go down in history as the opposite, yanking back American progress in direct repudiation of the Warren Court and the 20th century. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the first Latina to sit on the court, acknowledged as much in her dissent writing that this court stands in the way and rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress. The devastating impact of this decision cannot be overstated. The majority's vision of race neutrality will entrench racial segregation in higher education because racial inequality will persist so long as it is ignored. As for the court's conservative majority, six of them chose to side with the petitioner, in both of today's cases, Students for Fair Admissions, which, contrary to its name, is not actually students, but rather a group led by a man named Edward Blum, a conservative legal strategist who, for many, many years, has been bent on killing consideration of race in college admissions. Well, he finally got a court majority that would give him his way. But according to Chief Justice John Roberts' majority opinion, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. I mean, 
so long as aspiring students write about the way race impacted them in their college essays exactly the way John Roberts tells them to. And with today's death blow to affirmative action, one justice in particular seemed to revel in pulling up the ladder behind himself, Justice Clarence Thomas, who has acknowledged that he has benefited from affirmative action. In a frankly gleeful concurrence, Thomas wrote, even in the segregated South where I grew up, individuals were not the sum of their skin color. While I am painfully aware of the social and economic ravages which have befallen my race and all who suffer discrimination, I hold out enduring hope that this country will live up to its principles. Ah, adorable. Today, in court chambers, Thomas said the policies at UNC and Harvard fly in the face of our colorblind constitution, the constitution that at one point deemed him to be three-fifths of a human being. NBC News reports that as Thomas spoke, Justice Jackson stared straight ahead, apparently visibly angry. In the meantime, America's colleges and universities will begin the process of determining how to maintain diversity without violating this court's ruling. Joining me now is Reverend Al Sharpton, president of the National Action Network and host of Politics Nation, Ellie Mastal, justice correspondent for The Nation, Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney, MSNBC legal analyst and professor at the University of Alabama Law School, and David Inahosa, director at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, who argued in defense of affirmative action at the Supreme Court. Thank you both. Uh, thank you all for being here. And um, David Inhofe, I do want to start with you because you were there. You were in the courtroom as these cases, as this case was being argued. It, it, would you characterize these sort of interactions? I mean, I know in the Harvard Law case, C Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson recused because she actually has a moral center and a moral core, unlike the person I'm also talking about, Clarence Thomas, who takes lots of gifts. What was the what was the, what were the debates and the argument like? Well, Joy. Of course, you know, this is very difficult issues, right, whether or not you can consider race, how you're considering race. Uh, and given, you know, the incredible histories that we have here of racial exclusion and racial violence, it certainly seems fitting that, you know, we continue to have this because we've had a lot. We've had a couple of centuries of that violence in that history compared to just a few decades. That's right. Of being free of that, even at the University of North Carolina, they had uh you know, that university was created in 1789 to serve the children of slave owners at the time. And they fought for 200 years to continue to exclude uh, black students. So we knew going in to the argument that it was going to be a tough sell for this court, sure. this sitting court. Prior courts re with Republican appointed and Democratic appointed justices had put aside those differences of uh, politicized opinions. Uh, but this court, through some of its questions, you could kind of start reading through. But we did feel very strongly that the law, the facts, and the Constitution were on our side. And we had strong evidence from our own students discussing how and why it's important for them to lift up their own lived experiences and when those are affected by uh, their race. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we knew it was going to be tough. Uh, but we also felt that we had done what we needed to do. If this court was going to try and pull down on affirmative action or pull down on the progress that we made, mm -hmm. it was it should have been, you know, very tough for them yeah. to have done that. Sounds like it was pretty easy, though, for them. Um, and you and ironically, you're the one who had the students with you. Ellie Mastal, uh, eager to hear your thoughts on this decision. Well, let's start with the idea that the Supreme Court got it completely wrong in terms of the law. OK, the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, it was not passed to help white bail sons like Jarek Kushner and Brett Kavanaugh get into school. OK, the first time that we had affirmative action in this country was not the 1960s. It was the 1860s. We had affirmative action during Reconstruction. And we know that, we, that the affirmative action during Reconstruction was constitutional because they ratified the 14th Amendment so that they could pass legislation that would help to revoke the racism of the past, and those policies included affirmative action. So as Ketanji Brown-Jackson pointed out in her dissent and at oral arguments, the Supreme Court was just flatly wrong on the law. Now, we can all know why the Supreme Court decided to get this particular law so wrong, and it wasn't a help the AAPI students who were trying to get into Harvard and Yale. It was to trying to help 
mediocre white students who feel outcompeted and blame black students for, quote unquote, taking their spots. It was a terrible decision on the law, but we all know the real reason why people like John Roberts did it. As we continue to swallow this bitter fruit that the majority conservative justices have forced down our throats today, I want to read you one tweet that spoke to me from historian, writer, and friend of the show, Michael Harriet. He wrote, the Supreme Court did not strike down affirmative action. Admission preferences for legacies, donors, employee families, and special recommendations are all still allowed. The court struck down affirmative action for everyone except white people. To his point... Prior to today, Harvard has described race as a potential tip or plus factor, along with whether one of the student's parents graduated from the undergraduate college, whether a student comes from a low-income family, and whether a student has special athletic talent. After today, the only tips that remain are legacy, low income, and special athletic talent. Joining me now are Andrew Brennan, a 2019 graduate of the University of North Carolina, who was a party to the affirmative action case involving that university, Angie Gabo, president of the Harvard Black Students Association, and Michael Eric Dyson, professor of African American and Diaspora Studies at Vanderbilt University and co-author of Unequal. A story of America, apropos on today. I do want to start here at the table with you, Angie. Um, we were just having the whole Harvard House conversation, <laughs> but we're going to have a conversation that's more serious now. When I was at Harvard, there were a lot of legacies. There were a lot of people there who didn't get in because they had great grades. They got in because, you know, they mama and daddy, grandparents' name might be one of those exactly. buildings. <laughs> those people can still get in. Their affirmative action seems quite in place. Mm. What do you make of that? No, I totally agree. That's still true today. Um, there's also, like, you know, we've seen it um, in other cases, like the back door, the side door, mm -hmm. um, other ways to get into Harvard. Um, but they just struck it down just for black students and black and brown students um, on campus to be able to have um, specific access due to, like, disadvantages in yeah. specific circumstances. And when I was there, the, one of the other experiences I had is that the so-called affirmative action kids were some of the most brilliant people I've ever met. They all worked really hard in school, mm -hmm. were super nerds. I mean, Gatanji Brown Jackson was there when I was there. Right. Okay, this is a brilliant human being. Exactly. And they were hardworking. The very, very well-off, you know, very affluent kids didn't have to work as hard. They had it set no matter what happened to them. And so I wonder what you make of the fact that this court seems to think that choosing students like you is an affront to the Constitution. No, it's, it's really crazy. Cause at least in my experience, I really found that my race is my identity. All the stories that I've told Harvard, which is the reason I got in, um, were directly correlated with my race because I live as a black woman every single day. Um, and a lot of my peers um, and counterparts that are also black, like I get to hear their amazing stories and what they get to do um, every day that you just need in a school like Harvard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Andrew, let, you uh, testified, I think, in one of the lower court cases. Um, I would love to know what you make of the decision and how you think it will change the university um, from which you graduated if people cannot freely, the university cannot freely choose students like you. Thanks, Joy. Yeah, you know, when I, I think it's important to remember the context at UNC in which this decision has been made. Uh, when I was a student at UNC, the school was 11 percent black in a state that was 22 percent black. Uh, you know, Dory, I had grown up my entire life in the South, uh, but it wasn't until my time at UNC uh, did I see my first and second Confederate rallies on campus. Uh, and so it's within that context uh, that this lawsuit was brought. Uh, and I think it speaks to uh, how absurd it is uh, that this is not uh, a compelling interest uh, to ensure diversity on our college campuses. We share that. I saw my first Confederate flag at Harvard as well. Someone unfurled it very large so, and with, so that when those of us who were black had to walk beneath it as we went to the library. Fun times. Uh, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, you have taught at many PWIs, at many very prominent uh, in majority white universities. How do you think these universities, in your experience and the way that they try to recruit students, will react to this decision? Well, Joy, I taught at Chapel Hill for three years. Um, you know, I, I think that, look, the left has to have a long game and strategy like the right does. They've been laying in wait for 50 years to try to figure out Roe versus Wade, and they worked on it. 
And we got to understand and underscore before I directly answer your question, why voting matters. Because yes. Donald Trump not in office means that three Supreme Court justices that he appointed would not have been appointed and Hillary Clinton instead would have appointed them. So voting continues to matter. I think that schools have the wide latitude and the ability to count race as merit, right? So when we have a notion of merit, merit is not an abstract good, right? Uh, if you're in a boxing ring, it's meritorious to strike out and hurt somebody. If you're in your home, it's called domestic violence. The same act. Or when they said you can consider race, uh, I mean, race was considered in terms of harming black people, but not to heal them. Well, the same intrusion that a bullet makes in the body, a surgeon makes to remove it. So it can't be that race is the problem in terms of removing the hurt and bringing healing about as it was in terms of intending harm. This kind of gobbledygook and malfeasance and ledger domain by the Supreme Court justices is utterly ridiculous. White folk get the hook up, black folk get the hook. So what yeah. we have to do is to understand that we have to continue to strategize like we did before there was affirmative action so we can have a long plan. Schools can still consider race among many other factors. You can't stop a school from saying diversity is incredible, incredibly important and name that diversity in ways that obscure the racial dimension right. for strategic purposes. Let me go quickly ask you what you make of Clarence Thomas's concurrence. Yeah, that is a shameful manifestation of a lethal and malignant black self-hatred that continues to express itself in the derision that he holds black people. This is an unfortunate and remarkable situation where a black man who used affirmative action, because his mediocrity is not a secret. He barely speaks in the Supreme Court. His inarticulate vows continue to manifest an intelligence that is quite markedly uh, inferior, and yet he has the ability and the power to kill black people metaphorically by lifting up the very ladder that he used to get up on affirmative action. Yeah. This is so foul and nefarious in so many ways. And, Andrew, I'll ask you the same thing. What did you make of the fact that the first, uh, the, the second to black Supreme Court justice uh, gleefully uh, saw the end of affirmative action, which he has been trying to do for a long time? I, I think it's a real shame. Um, and as Justice Sotomayor pointed out in her dissent, uh, because of today's decision, uh, the police can consider my race when assessing uh, suspicion of a crime. Uh, but a college admissions officer uh, can't consider my race uh, when assessing uh, the potential contributions that I could make to a college campus. Yeah. I think it's that sort of tortured logic uh, that makes uh, no sense. And it's not just black people that are harmed by this, Joy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Having diverse college campuses benefit black and white students of all, all races uh, benefit. So that's what In we're losing. Indeed. Angie, I'm going to give you the last word here. What advice would you give uh, the next you who's applying to Harvard in this environment? I would say hold out hope. Um, I was outside the Supreme Court today, and there's a lot of people who are rallying. Um, and also take action. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people will, you know, say that they feel uncomfortable or they feel disappointed by this decision. Yeah. But we, that also has to come with action. That also has to come with, you know, community building, community Amen. organizing. And I would give one piece of advice to everybody who is unhappy with the Supreme Court. Vote and vote all the way down the ballot because it is the United States Senate who confirms Supreme Court justices. And it's who you pick for president that's going to decide who gets nominated. You've got to vote. Don't leave it to people who like Donald Trump. Uh, Andrew Brennan, Angie Gabo, Michael Eric Dyson, thank you all very much.